I remember getting out at the end of that swim and looking down at my hands, and my hands were were swollen. They were completely frozen solid. I couldn't bend my fingers. The pain was absolutely excruciating. And at that moment, I thought to myself, how many more years have you got in you to do this type of stuff? How many more years? There's a price which you pay. Yeah, there's a price. Those are the moving words of endurance swimmer Lewis Pugh as he climbed out onto the snow after swimming through a subglacial tunnel beneath the ice sheet in Antarctica earlier this year, wearing nothing more than his speedos. Lewis is UN patron of the oceans. He spent the last 30 years taking on extreme and dangerous challenges in the most inhospitable waters on Earth to highlight the plight of the North and South Poles, the devastating effects of climate change and the damage we're inflicting on our planet, its oceans and extraordinary wildlife. I first heard Lewis speak at a corporate event and it's fair to say you could hear a pin drop. This week, Lewis is my guest on the Convex Conversation, and he joins me now from his home in South Africa. Lewis, I hope you're enjoying some warmer weather over there. Well, it's it's winter here, so you're probably enjoying warmer weather in the United Kingdom, but it's, it's lovely to speak to you. Your trip to Antarctica this year is worthy of a podcast on its own. I mean, talk me through it, Lewis. What was the idea behind it? So scientists have now discovered lots of lakes on top of the ice sheet in Antarctica, and so it was a very simple mission. It was to go down to Antarctica and attempt to do a swim in one of these lakes to graphically show world leaders how the Antarctic is melting, just like the Arctic is melting as well. So I took a plane from Cape Town down to Antarctica, and the scientists have now discovered 66,000 of these lakes on top of the ice sheet. When we went to try and find the best place to swim, we actually found a river underneath the ice sheet. And so I plucked up the courage and swam down this river. It was an incredible experience. The colors were so vivid underneath the ice there. So as I entered the tunnel, it was this turquoise blue, and then the tunnel sort of meandered its way underneath the ice sheet, and then it went to a dark royal blue, and then to an indigo, then to a violet. And in the middle of the tunnel, probably had about 100 meters of ice on top of me. It was almost completely dark, and then I carried on swimming and eventually came out the other end. It was the most beautiful places I'd ever seen in the whole world. But there's a real problem, and that the problem is because of climate change, our polar regions are melting, and they're melting very, very rapidly. I'm really looking forward to hearing more in detail about the whole process, you know, the breakdown that you've done of a polar swim into its four stages. But this is a difficult and challenging environment to work in before you even start the actual challenge, isn't it? And it's one that it's very difficult for us to imagine, you know, what it's like for you and your film crew and your medical team and all the people that are part of this to sort of live in, really. Just try and explain to us what it's like when you get there and what conditions are like. Well, it's not just difficult, but it's a very high consequence environment. So if you're swimming underneath ice, obviously ice can fall. I remember standing at the beginning of the tunnel about to enter the water and thinking, if I get this wrong, if ice falls, this is where I will, I will die. But I feel so passionately, I've been swimming now for 30 years in the world's oceans. I've seen them change completely in just 30 years. I feel so passionately about trying to highlight how important it is to protect these areas. These are the risks I'm prepared to go to. But the swims are just one part of it. Afterwards, on the other end of it, are the negotiations which I undertake with various governments to protect these places. And what we're trying to do in Antarctica is to create a series of protected areas like national parks, but these are in international waters, we're trying to create three very, very big ones. We created an enormous one a few years ago in the Ross Sea. It's 1.5 million square kilometers. It's the size of Britain, France, Germany, Italy, all put together. Now we're trying to build another three collectively. There'll be over 4 million square kilometers of protected waters, protecting these areas from industrial overfishing. They'll be almost double the size of Western Europe. So before I get into these tunnels, I, you know, it's important, obviously, to focus on why you're doing it, get your mind right. I think it's the night before the swims, though, which are the most difficult. The Inuit people, the indigenous people who live in the northern Arctic, I spend quite a bit of time with them. And they always say that in every single person, 
there is an enormous battle taking place in the mind between two wolves, a good wolf and a bad wolf. And which wolf is going to win? Well, it's the wolf which you feed. And I remember the night before attempting this swim underneath the, the ice in Antarctica, just thinking about all the possible things that can go wrong. It's the night before the swim where you wonder whether you've done enough training. <laughs> I'm no, no, no longer a 30-year-old young swimmer. I'm, I'm now 50 years old. Yes, I've got a lot of experience, which is very important, but I'm also going into a very high consequence environment. Not only is the water extremely cold, zero degrees centigrade, but also I've got ice to the left, I've got ice to the right, I've got ice underneath me, ice can fall from the top and there's stalactites from the roof and these are extremely sharp. You can easily take a stroke and put your hand through a stalactite. But the most dangerous thing of all, out of all these dangers, and obviously there are a lot, is what we call a moulon. So a moulon is a crack in the ice which suddenly develops and the water then drains through and literally drops hundreds of meters down to the bottom rock. And that's what makes this place so dangerous from a climate change point of view is because these moulons are developing. The water then, which is developed on top of the ice sheet, then goes down these moulons, down these holes, and then lubricates the bedrock, making these ice sheets unstable. Obviously, if you're a swimmer, the thought of swimming along and suddenly seeing a whirlpool in front of you and descending down one of these things, that's, that's, not, that's not what you uh, signed up for. So the night before the swim is the most frightening time. And I remember lying in my tent and the wind was blasting outside and thinking to myself, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow? We then climbed across the ice sheet to the entrance of the tunnel. And that's when I really need to focus myself. There's no past. There's no future. There's just present. I just need to be present. All the swims which I've done over the previous 30 years, they're fantastic. They give you great experience and confidence. But now I'm in front of the ice sheet and I've now got to go for it. And I stood there. The whole team went to the end. I said a short prayer. And then I said to myself, you know, if I'm not going to stand up for this place, how on earth are we going to get the world to properly protect this place. I mean, this place is thousands and thousands of kilometers away from the capital cities of the world, but all our futures will be determined in the polar regions because the melting which is happening there right now is so fast. I just focused on that and then I dived in. And then I just tried to make sure now I must be really present, not thinking about grand dreams of protecting the Arctic and the Antarctic. Now I just got to make sure that every single stroke is as good as it can be and make sure also that I'm navigating through this tunnel effectively and avoiding all the stalactites. And halfway through the tunnel, I remember it got so dark. It had gone from this turquoise to the rich royal blue to an indigo to a violet and then virtually black. I had to take my goggles off and I slowed down and I said to myself, Lewis, just slow down and just look at this because this is the most beautiful place you've ever been in the whole world and nobody else will ever come here again. And I slowed down and as that happened, some of the ice above me moved and the sound is like a cannon going off. It's absolutely terrifying. I looked up, I thought to myself, please, no, no. I prayed that all this ice above me wasn't going to come tumbling down on top of my head, but it stayed up there. And then I carried on swimming as quickly as I could and got through to the end of the tunnel. And there was my friend, the Russian Slav Fetisov, who grabbed me and pulled me out straight into a warm tent. And then you've got to reheat yourself because I'd been in the water for over 10 minutes in very, very cold water. I would imagine your body's in shock and in pain, is it? I always say to people that in any of the polar swims, you go through four stages or maybe five stages. The first is utter fear. I mean, it's not a normal place to swim, Antarctica or the Arctic. So the first stage is fear. As soon as you dive in, it's regret. You think to yourself, how on earth did I get into this silly situation? And then very quickly, the pain. The pain is extreme, especially in the fingers and the toes. And I find in my wrists, I mean, it's pain on an exponential level and the pain ratchets up and up and up and up. And then it gets to a stage where it's sheer desperation. You just want to get out. But then finally, I got to the end and Slava grabbed me. And I, I mean, what's actually happened inside me is as soon as I've dived into the water, my warm blood has been shunted to my core to try and protect the vital organs, the brain, 
the heart, the lungs, and then my arms and my legs get extremely cold. I then get into a warm tent and now I've got to reheat myself. And it's just the last stage of a polar swim is this sheer relief that you finally made it. But it takes over 50 minutes to reheat myself afterwards because then what happens is the relatively warm blood in my core then goes to my fingers and my toes to try and reheat those extremities which are so cold. And then ice cold blood then starts returning to the heart and that's a dangerous bit. So even though I am out the water, my core body temperature keeps dropping for over 30 minutes even though I'm out of the water. So are you very closely monitored at this point by doctors? Sure. On on all these polar swims, I have a doctor with me. Down in Antarctica, we had a British doctor, Charlotte Haldane, a real expert. The thing is, we're pioneering. Nobody's done these type of things before. So there's not a lot of body of science that you can look to, to work out, you know, what is actually going to happen. I've done nearly 20 years of these swims, so we think we know what's going to happen to us. But you do need to have a doctor there just in case things are going to go wrong. And as a 50-year-old man, Lewis, you mentioned your age at the beginning. Do you think twice now about putting your body through this? I know you completely believe in the message and what needs to be done. But do you worry about the fact that perhaps your body doesn't recover as easily as it did when you were younger? I do worry about it. Back in 2015, I did a big swim in the Ross Sea, which is in Antarctica. The Ross Sea, for 15 years, the world had been trying to protect the Ross Sea. And under international law, there are 23, at the time, there were 23 nations who had to decide this. These are the nations who have scientific stations down in Antarctica. And for 15 years, they hadn't been able to agree it. Two nations still had to agree it, and that was Russia and China. And I, it sounds crazy now, but I I just always believed cold water swimming is a language which Russians understand. There can be beauty in adversity. And and I don't know any Russian that wasn't taken by their parents when they were young down to a cold lake when they, you know, in winter and, and they jump in and they swim around. So cold water swimming is extremely popular in Russia. And they also very much respect resilience. So the plan was that I would go down to the Ross Sea because I'm trying to to highlight an issue which is 15,000 kilometers away from Russia at a time when a Malaysian airline has just been shot down in the Ukraine, at a time when there's so many geopolitical issues, when there's lots of sanctions against Russia, Russia's dealing with an awful lot. Why should Russia care about Antarctica? And so you can't keep knocking at the same door or trying the same door with the same set of keys in international diplomacy. So I thought to myself, why don't I go down there, do a swim there? Russians love swimming. And then afterwards, go along there and as UN patron of the oceans, try and get a meeting with President Putin's team. And so I went there and I did a swim down there. Afterwards, I went straight to Moscow and I met with the Minister of Defense. I met with the Environment Minister and I met with Putin's number two, Sergei Shoigu. And I said to them, we have to protect this place. This is one of the last wilderness areas left on this earth. This area now is going to be destroyed by industrial overfishing. Please sign the deal. And I shuttled backwards and forwards for two years to Moscow until finally they signed the deal. And then President Obama was able to persuade the Chinese to also sign the deal to create this enormous area. Now fast forward to 2020, and we're now trying to get three areas protected. One in East Antarctica one in the Weddell Sea and one on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is an amazing place. And just going back to your question about the impact on my body, a week after the swim underneath the ice sheet, I was in Moscow and I was walking across Red Square. And I don't know if you've walked across Red Square before, but Red Square has got cobbles. And I'm off to meet Putin's number two, Sergei Ivanov, in the Kremlin. And so I'm wearing a suit and a tie and I'm wearing my smart shoes And I could feel every single cobble under my feet because I had such bad frostbite. And I said to myself then and there, I said, I can't keep doing these swims. One swim in the Ross Sea to get that area protected. One swim in the East Antarctica to get that area protected. You know, I'll be doing this until my dying day. (laughs) So I went in there and I asked for it all. I said, you know, it is 2020. It is 200 years since the discovery of Antarctica. And Antarctica was discovered. It just so happens by Admiral Bellinghausen, who was a Russian admiral. 
I said, I can think of no better way to honor Admiral Bellinghausen's discovery. And also with discovery comes responsibility. I can think of no better way than protecting all these three areas this year. And so these negotiations have been carrying on and they will be concluding in October this year. And I pray that these three other areas will be protected. And I noticed that Chile has just joined the Global Ocean Alliance, so is now one of 23 countries committed to this. So that's good news too, isn't it? Yes, it's fantastic. I mean, I did a swim two years ago along the length of the English Channel. So I started at Land's End and I swam from Land's End to Plymouth, where I grew up as a young boy, from Plymouth all the way across Lime Bay to Portsmouth, from Portsmouth to Brighton, all the way through to the end right the way through to Dover. And the reason why I was doing this was to try and get our waters properly protected in Britain. You will not believe it, but only seven square kilometers of waters around the United Kingdom, seven square kilometers are fully protected. So no drilling for oil, no drilling for gas, no industrial fishing, no gunnery exercises by the Royal Navy, but just allowing nature to recover just seven square kilometers. And the waters around the United Kingdom are 270,000 square kilometers. So we have protected, (laughs) it's embarrassing. And so that's what that swim was about. It was saying to the British government, we need to pull up our socks. When I did this swim, I saw a few dolphins in Lime Bay. I saw a few birds. I saw lots of jellyfish and very little else. In 528 kilometers, I saw so little fish, and wildlife in the English Channel. And so at the end of the swim, Michael Gove, who used to be Secretary of State for the Environment, he came down and he asked me, what do you want, Lewis? I said, we need to be protecting at least 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. This is what the scientists are saying to us. He said, okay. A month later, the United Kingdom then agreed to this target and they went to the United Nations and they said, please, all nations, we must agree to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. They then created this Global Ocean Alliance. Over 20 countries have now agreed with them. Canada also recently agreed, which is a great result because Canada is the second biggest country in the world with an enormous maritime coastline. But it's still hard work. Governments can set targets, but as we've seen in the past, they sometimes don't have the determination and consistency to keep on going and to achieve them. We're now in a race against time to protect our oceans. As a swimmer, I'm in the oceans and I'm seeing them change every day. And the decisions that we make today in that race against time are absolutely critical now, aren't they, for future generations? You're absolutely right. And we don't have a big window. I mean, just to give you an example of some of the changes which I'm seeing in the oceans, when I did my first swim in the Arctic, in 2005, I swam in the high Arctic, in a place called Svalbard, which is in the Norwegian Arctic, very, very close to the North Pole. And I did my first swim there. The water was three degrees centigrade. I went back 12 years later. The water was no longer three degrees, but now it had risen all the way to 10 degrees in just 12 years. Same place, same time of year in summer. And that's devastating because if you've got warm water, Moving up the Atlantic into the Arctic, that ice will melt. And what the scientists are telling us now is very, very bleak. And that is that over the next 12 years, they expect there to be very little sea ice in the Arctic in the summer months. So if you have a child who's entering school this year, in 12 years time, unless we get a grip of this situation, they'll be entering a very, very different world. And sorry to sound naive, but just in layman's terms, how does what happens at the North and the South Pole impact on the rest of the planet? So the polar regions are absolutely crucial for us. The Antarctic regulates the climate and also provides so much nutrition for all the world's oceans. Also, because these areas are white, they reflect the sunlight You know, when the sea ice melts, you then got a black ocean underneath. It absorbs the sunlight even quicker. So if these areas melt, not only does the climate change increase in speed, but also then you get sea level rise. So Greenland, for example, a big island up in the Arctic, the ice in Greenland, we're seeing some of these glaciers melt away extremely quickly. That's a seven meter sea level rise, seven meter sea level rise That, that impacts so many of the world's great cities. So our futures will be determined in the Arctic and the Antarctic. 
one of my big frustrations because if you were to look at the British cabinet or you were to look at the members of parliament, 650 members of parliament in the House of Commons, we've got 785 peers. How many of them have taken the time to go to the Arctic or to the Antarctic and see what's happening? I think very few, very, very few. And, and how many business leaders, how many of the top FTSE 100 business leaders have taken the time to go and see what's happening? Because this is going to be affecting every single person on the planet, every future generation and the whole of the animal kingdom. And the sad thing is that very few have been to the Arctic or the Antarctic. The Arctic, for example, is so easy to get to. You leave on an aeroplane from Gatwick Airport at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and in the evening, you can be in Svalbard, high up in the Arctic and meet scientists. How do we make sure that the policymakers and global leaders who are showing a willingness to make a difference keep going through with it? And you know, how do we keep that momentum going, Lewis? It's great when you do one of your big projects and we see you and we're all very much aware of what's going on, but you sort of alluded to the fact it's difficult, isn't it, to make sure that they keep pressing ahead with it. And that must be frustrating at times, I would have thought. It's really frustrating because you see these wonderful programs which Sir David Attenborough brings out, you know, Blue Planet, Frozen Planet, this latest one on extinction. And I think some of the leaders think that it's sufficient to watch that and believe that you understand what is actually happening. But the problem with that is that the beauty of these BBC productions can distract from the hard reality. You have to go there and you have to see it and you have to speak to the scientists and you have to speak to the local fishermen and the Inuit communities to understand how quickly this is happening. I also think that some straight talking is needed. And, you know, it's been like a breath of fresh air to listen to the young people like Greta Thunberg, who are speaking truth to world leaders now. Their futures will be very much determined by the decisions which the current leadership of this world take. I would encourage them to keep on going and hold these leaders to account. In your film that you made, the 10-minute film was absolutely stunning, On the Edge. There was some spectacular footage of you with Emperor Penguins and it looks a very special moment when you're walking amongst them. But of course, life for them is hard enough in terrain like that. But the pressures of climate change and overfishing in the Southern Ocean are making their lives very difficult. It's not just pretty pictures, is it? Emperor penguins are uh, 17 species of penguins. The emperor penguin is called the emperor penguin for a reason. It is really majestic. And when you go to an emperor penguin colony and you see these animals in their natural environment, it's absolutely amazing. And each one of them seems to have their own little personality. And just to sit there and watch them as was intended is just beautiful. But as you pointed out, two big things are impacting them. The first is climate change happening very, very quickly in the Arctic. And the second one is this big industrial overfishing. When I was down in Antarctica this year, it was quite late in the season and there were many chicks who were just lying dead in the snow. And it's over 30% of emperor penguins die naturally. It's a very, very harsh reality. They don't need the additional pressure of climate change, which we're causing and industrial fishing. So uh, that's my message to world leaders. We need to create these very, very big marine protected areas around Antarctica to protect these incredible species. Antarctica and the Arctic, these are the homes of the emperor penguin, of the humpback whale, of the blue whale, of the walrus, of the polar bear. It's their home. We go there as guests. And you always seem to be welcomed with open arms by the scientists that you meet in these places. They must be overjoyed that you're taking the time to speak to leaders and to raise awareness of what's going on. I meet many, many scientists and I meet many politicians and there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between the two. So sometimes science is communicated in a way which politicians who have got very, very busy schedules and are also grappling with so many issues at the moment. I mean, I, I do have some sympathy for politicians at the moment. Not only do they in the United Kingdom dealing with the COVID crisis, but they're also dealing with Brexit. They're dealing with the trade war, which is emerging. They're dealing with the situation between the United Kingdom and Russia and the situation between the United Kingdom and China is not healthy at the moment. 
They're dealing with so many serious issues, and that's not even dealing with local issues of housing, of education, of providing medical care, of the elderly, all these type of things. They've got so many issues. And so it's so important that we present the science in a way which is easy to understand and shows two things. Shows the speed at which our planet is changing and also provides simple solutions which they can enact. I hope that I'm able to do that. I hope that these swims tell a story. Back in 2007, I did a swim across the North Pole. I hope that it was just a very, very simple message. You shouldn't be able to swim across the North Pole. The North Pole should be frozen over and has been frozen over for thousands and thousands of years. And so that's what I try to do. It gets lots of media attention, principally because I'm swimming in just a Speedo and a cap and goggles in such cold water. But then afterwards, I hope that I'm able to share the stories in a way which enables these very, very important wilderness areas to be protected. You've earned the name the human polar bear. And actually, I was going to ask you about just swimming in speedos because the first headline I read when I started to prepare for today's podcast was from the Times and it read the man who swam under the ice sheet in Antarctica in just his speedos. I wondered if part of it is because that does draw extra attention to what you're doing. But is there another reason? Have you tried, you know, the grease and all that kind of stuff and it it's just doesn't really make any difference? I've swum the English Channel, across the English Channel with grease and I've swum across the English Channel without grease and it didn't make a jot of difference either way. Certainly, if I wore a wetsuit or a dry suit, it would make a significant difference. But when I did my first really big polar swim, which was that swim across the North Pole, I had a simple decision. Was I going to swim with a wetsuit or a dry suit or was I going to swim just in my speedos? And I made that decision based on a few factors. The first one was that I'm urging world leaders to be courageous. I'm urging them to make the hard decisions, to take the decisions today and not to kick the problem down towards future generations. I didn't feel that, and I'm urging them to dive in and go for it. I, I didn't feel that swimming in a wetsuit or a dry suit was consistent with that message. The second reason why I swam in just a pair of Speedos was because I knew, you know, back in 2007, I knew that if I was able to do it, and and I wasn't sure I was able to do it, but if I was able to do it, I knew that would would make the front pages of newspapers, and, and I was trying to get media attention. The third reason, though, is of historical interests. Ever since Captain Matthew Webb, who was the first person to swim across the English Channel in 1875, ever since he swam across the English Channel, We've all adhered to the same rules, just a cap, speedos and goggles. And you can have grease if you so wish. And I like that because you can compare yourself to the pioneers of the sport. And I hope that swimmers who follow me will be able to compare themselves with the records which I'm breaking these days. You mentioned that you grew up in Plymouth. I mean, tell us a bit about your childhood, Lewis, and what growing up there was like and where this passion came from. I grew up in Plymouth. My father was a doctor in the Royal Navy, so I grew up in the Royal Naval Hospital in Plymouth. My grandmother was South African. So when when I was 10 years old, my parents said, "Okay, we're going to go and live out in South Africa. It was a very unusual decision because everybody else was going the opposite way. Anyway, we got on board a ship and we sailed out to South Africa. And I was just 10 years old and we arrived there. I'll never forget. We arrived in Table Bay. It was 1980. Britain was going through economic turmoil. I remember arriving there and the lights of Table Mountain were lit up. We got up off that ship as immigrants, each one of us carrying a, a little green Royal Navy bag. And I wasn't aware of all the changes which were occurring at that time. And then I did my schooling in Cape Town. And I was very, very lucky because the school I went to in Cape Town was right next to the Atlantic Ocean. And my mother loved to read history books to me and especially about the polar explorers. And so ever since I was sort of 15 or 16, I was dreaming about going to Antarctica. And I would look out of that window every single day in class. And many, many times the teacher, Mr. Christopher Njarsfeld, would shout at me and say, Lewis, concentrate. It's interesting, there were two other boys in my class. One sat on one side of me, Len John van der Waal. He became a professional sailor. On the other side of me, Justin Strong, who became world champion surfer. So your environment, (laughs) your environment really does determine where you're probably going to go in life. And so when I was a young boy, I was 17 years old, I decided to swim from Robben Island to Cape Town. I barely made that swim. 
but I absolutely loved it. And then every year after that, I just tried to do a swim, which was a bit harder, a bit tougher, a bit colder than the next. I then went off and I became a maritime lawyer. And this love for the environment and maritime law and swimming all came together in one place. And that was down in Antarctica. In 2005, I did a swim inside a volcano. So down in Antarctica, there's an island called Deception Island. It's a horseshoe-shaped island. And this volcano has sunk into the sea. Now, I've never swum inside a volcano before. So this was the first thing that I wanted to do. So this volcano is obviously flooded by the sea. The water's still icy cold, two degrees centigrade. Anyway, we stopped the ship there and I got out. I dived into the sea and I swam across this bay. And within minutes of diving into this bay, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Underneath me were literally hundreds and hundreds of whale bones, jaw bones, spine bones, rib bones. This was, had been the epicenter of the whaling industry about 100 years beforehand. The whalers had come down there, captured, killed the whales, and then taken off the blubber and melted it down in pots on the beach, which are still there on Deception Island. During this swim, I mean, if there was a sort of Damascus experience or a moment when I realized I had to use my swimming to try and be a voice for the oceans, that was it. And I like to think that those whales' bones, which are still there, preserved in that clear blue water of Antarctica, I like to think that they are a good reminder of man's potential for folly, but they're not. I mean, first we came and we literally killed all the seals and then the whales and now the big industrial fishing fleets are taking out the Antarctic toothfish. And now they're going for the tiniest life on which everything relies down in Antarctica, krill. It's like we never, ever learn the lesson. And this was my message to President Putin's team. And that was that we now have this one opportunity to protect this place. Very, very few people have an opportunity to bend history to really bend and change history. And imagine the world if we didn't have the Serengeti National Park. Imagine the world if we didn't have the Kruger National Park or Dartmoor National Park or, or any of these other wonderful national parks in the world. Our world would be very, very different. That's what's happening now down in Antarctica. And we need to properly, properly protect this place right now, like those leaders did 100 years ago with terrestrial national parks. Are protected marine areas the answer? They're certainly one of the answers. On their own, they're not enough. You can have the most fantastic marine protected area done in Antarctica, but unless you also tackle climate change, then that place is going to change and the animals are not going to be able to survive properly in that environment unless they're able to adapt. And so all roads now lead to Glasgow. The big climate change conference is called COP26, which is taking place in Glasgow next year. It's being hosted by the United Kingdom. It's the biggest conference the United Kingdom has ever hosted. And there'll be an awful lot of expectations on the United Kingdom to deliver a conference which is ambitious and which tackles climate change head on. And as well as tackling climate change head on, what about plastic pollution? I mean, we interviewed Dee Kafari, who was the first woman to sail solo the wrong way round the world. And she said that when she was at Point Nemo, the fish there are contaminated with plastic, even though the nearest person to you at that point is on the International Space Station. It makes me so angry. I remember as a young boy swimming in Whitsand Bay near Plymouth and I just don't remember any plastic pollution. There's not a beach I go to now in the world where there isn't plastic pollution. It is incredibly depressing to be high up in the Arctic and to see how much plastic pollution there. In different parts of the world, it's different things. When you're up in the Arctic, it's often fishing net, it's buoys, it's, it's slip slops, it's things like that. You go to India. I was involved with a beach cleanup there, which is now run into a beach cleanup that's been going on for over three years in Mumbai. And there just so much packaging, slip slops again, straws, bottles, Coke bottles, all these types of things. And on that beach, it was literally up to our shoulders at the beginning of the beach cleanup. The leader of that beach cleanup, a man called Afro Shah, he bought in trucks, he bought in lorries, he bought in bulldozers, and he cleans that beach every single weekend with volunteers 
Sometimes over a thousand people come down to clean that beach. And at the end of the weekend, finally, they can see sand underneath their feet. But you go back there on the Wednesday, the Thursday, the Friday, and the Indian Ocean now has begun to vomit back more and more and more plastic. We have to stop the plastic from getting into the rivers. We've got to stop the plastic from getting into the oceans because once it's in the oceans, it's nigh impossible to clean it up. Birds eat it and die. Fish eat it and die. Whales ingest it and die. It's devastating our environment and it's so solvable. When you did the long swim, when you did the channel, were you swimming through plastic pollution at times? So we teamed up with SAS, which is Surfers Against Sewerage. It is one of the most fantastic charities in the United Kingdom, Surfers Against Sewerage, because they bring out volunteers every single weekend from Cornwall all the way up to Scotland to Northern Ireland, right the way around the United Kingdom. And it's ordinary people. Men, women, children, surfers, beach walkers, dog walkers, anybody, swimmers, anybody who cares about the beach, look up Surfers Against Sewage and they do these incredible cleanups. So we did some cleanups along the beach. And yes, sadly, although it's certainly it's not on the level that you see in Mumbai, throughout beaches in the United Kingdom, we've got plastic pollution and we have to stop it from happening. And we have to constantly clean our beaches to make sure that they are safe for ourselves and for our incredible wildlife around the United Kingdom. So when you were swimming the channel, when you get to the point of absolute exhaustion, what <laughs> keeps you going, Lewis? I, uh, it was a long way, wasn't it? <laughs> 528 kilometres, 328 miles is a long way. <laughs> when I went down to Land's End the night before the swim, that's when I... It was so overwhelming because we'd taken the train from Paddington and it, you know, literally we took the overnight train all the way down to Penzance. And, and you realize that <laughs> I realized I'm going to have to swim every single meter of this all the way back. <laughs> anyway, I made three promises to myself on that beach at Land's End. And the first one was that I had to leave my doubts at Land's End. Because if you don't leave your doubts there, as soon as you get an injury or as soon as there's a problem and there will be problems, you'll be out of that water. The second promise I made my team was every day I would swim 10 kilometers. And the third promise I made them was that if we couldn't go out on a specific day because it was too rough, too dangerous to take the yacht out, the following day I would do 20 kilometers. And that was the only way I got to Dover. It's about being persistent and consistent and just keeping on going day in and day out. The other trick to doing a swim of such a magnitude is to ensure you have a really good team. So I assembled a, I'm not shy to say, they were a world-class team. They were absolutely magnificent. There were days when we were swimming in very, very big seas. Off the Isle of Wight, there's a cape off the bottom of the Isle of Wight called St. Catherine's Point. It was dangerous swimming there. And, you know, if you're going to swim across the English Channel, you wait for the right day. I didn't have that opportunity, you know, because every day I had to swim. And so there were some days I was swimming in absolutely atrocious conditions. Other days when I was swimming through jellyfish after jellyfish, and a jellyfish never stings you on the toe. It's always straight in the face or in the armpits or in the groin. <laughs> and it's going through conditions like this that if you've got a team who are supportive, but don't moddy coddle you, but just say, come on, keep on going. You've got to do your 10 kilometers today and then you can rest. That got me right the way through to the end to deliver the message to the UK government. You have to have a world-class team because in my heading, other significant swims, is the Himalayas. When things didn't really go to plan on your first attempt to swim a glacial lake at Everest, what happened there? Yes, I mean, I completely underestimated the impact of altitude. I mean, I obviously realised that altitude would have an impact on me. I did my training in the Andes uh, in South America. And then a few days before that swim, I had trained a little bit lower in, in a lake called Lake Imja. But I just didn't realize just how much an extra 300 meters in altitude would take. So that the swim was at 5,300 meters, which is the approximate height of Kilimanjaro in Africa. I dived in, I started swimming. I was swimming fast, crawl, because that's the way I've always swum. 
I swim crawl because I need to get the swim over and done with as quickly as possible. And I swim fast to be able to generate the heat. And I came close to drowning. I, I just couldn't breathe. I was gasping for air. I had to get out. And then the leader of the expedition, who used to be a general in the British Army called General Sewell, he said to me, he said, Lewis, you need to take a radical tactical shift. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, Lewis, instead of swimming, crawl. He said, and you got your head in the water, why don't you swim breaststroke? He said, instead of swimming as quickly as possible, he said, you need to swim as slowly as possible. Sounds counterintuitive, but you need to preserve your oxygen. And then he said, but the most important thing is instead of swimming with all this aggression, which may work in the Arctic and in South Africa, Lewis, you need to swim with real humility. And I remember him pointing up to Mount Everest and saying to me, you cannot bully Mount Everest. And so the next day we went in and we did it his method and I made the swim. Everest can humble you in a good way. Well, I'm sure it can. We've talked about what governments and policy leaders and decision makers can do. But what about us? What about us, the ordinary individual who, you know, sometimes probably in danger of putting our head in the sand and thinking we're tiny and we can't make a difference? We can, can't we? Yes, I think all of us can make a significant difference. And we're now obviously in, in a race against time. The day for in, in action has long passed. That's the first point. The day for inaction has long passed. The second point is, the sad reality is that a lot of us are environmentally illiterate. And I say that with respect, but we don't know the impact which we're having on a daily basis on the environment. We need to understand the impact which we're having, because I'm sure that if people understood the impact which they are having, they would change their behavior. Every single purchase we make, whether it be the way we travel, the food we eat, the way we clothe ourselves, every single purchase which we make has an impact on the environment. And we must be taught this. We must be taught this at school. And obviously, elder people also need to be taught this. I think the last thing I would be saying is my love for the environment it didn't grow up in a vacuum. It grew up because I was very fortunate that I grew up in South Africa and my parents took me to national parks. They took me to Shishlui, to Umfalozi, to the great big Kruger National Park. As a young boy, I saw elephants and lions and, and, and all these magnificent creatures. But we also have incredible national parks in the United Kingdom. I would urge people to take your children, take your nephews, take your nieces, go to these beautiful places which we have, you know, in Scotland and all the way down, down into Devon and elsewhere. Take them to these national parks, walk in them, appreciate them, they are precious. And when you see stuff which is so precious as these national parks, you don't want to damage the environment. So I think those, are, those would be the things which I would be urging people to do. And Lewis, what is next for you? I mean, after the swim under the ice sheet, where do you go next? Well, I'm, I'm absolutely determined to try and get these three areas properly protected. Shortly, I'll be going back to Russia to try and conclude those negotiations. But then for me, all roads lead to Glasgow. All roads lead to that crucial climate change conference which will be taking place next year in November in Glasgow. That's where I'll be urging world leaders to really get serious. My message to them will be, you know, as the UN patron of the oceans, please do not come to Glasgow unless you're serious, unless you understand the speed of change, unless you're prepared also to make big commitments and to see them through. Our children deserve it. Our wildlife deserves it and our futures require it. Lewis, we really look forward to you being here in Glasgow next year. Thank you very much for being our guest today and congratulations to you and your team for On The Edge. Thank you all and thank you very, very much. You've been listening to Lewis Pugh, UN Patron of the Oceans. On the Edge, the short film by Miguel Booth about Lewis's Antarctica swim is an extraordinary watch and is available on his social media. He's well worth a follow, at Lewis Pugh on Instagram and Twitter, where he posts incredible images and information on climate change, the environment and his progress with world leaders. I hope you're enjoying our podcast guests as much as I am. There are plenty of episodes to listen to at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify and Apple and Google Podcasts. I'll be back next week, so bye for now.